great to be here again. I think it's been since 1985, since the last, the last time I was here. Uh, and uh, this is my thank you slide and conflict of interest slide. The little spinning molecule there is transfer RNA. I'm a, I'm a crystallographer by training. I started working at, at, uh, with Sung Ho Kim in 1974 on transfer RNA. And, it pretty, and it's been one of my passions ever since is working on the genetic code, which transfer RNA is a, a key component of, of the genetic code. We're now engineering the genetic code uh, to make uh, pretty radical deviation from that, and that involves uh, changing the, the activity of the synthetases that, that interact with the tRNA and the ribosome, with, which also interacts with tRNA. And, uh, and of course, there's uh, crystal structures for all of those that make our life uh, much, much easier, and it's great to be here at the source of so much uh, structural biology. But I'm not going to mention too much about that other than what I just said because I want to uh, uh, expose you to some other things, many of which are also structural, but at a, at, at, a, at a vast range of structures, ranging from the atomic to the uh, eco ecosystems. So, uh, uh, I just want to touch on these four uh, topics. Some of them will be uh, more rigorous than others, more entertaining. Uh, this is, uh, the first is engineering ecosystems. Uh, in, in a certain sense, everything that we do uh, that involves uh, reading and editing genomes could impact an ecosystem, uh, intentionally or not. Um, and two extreme examples of this are resistance to all viruses, which are essentially separating one life form from all other life forms. So, so it's more than creating a new species, which species definition might be that, that they, that two species don't interbreed. But this, uh, there's horizontal transfer throughout life, and this is a species that in principle is uh, not capable of horizontal transfer. And then uh, an example of many that where we're uh, intentionally blurring the species barrier so that any, any organism can exchange DNA with any other um, it's, it's part of editing, it's part of uh, uh, things like GFP, various tools, and an example is being able to transplant organs uh, from uh, animals to humans. And then finally, I'll end on, on, the, on the longest of these four, uh, is how we're using artificial intelligence and machine learning to compute, design, and, ev and rapidly evolve uh, a particular viral structure, uh, three-dimensional structure. So, just to, just to be somewhat provocative here, um, uh, challenge uh, three conventions. Uh, one is that we have, uh, we're in the middle of a sixth, sixth extinction and it's, and it's all, all our fault. Um, but there's a population bomb that shows how, how we can't control our uh, urges and, uh, and then it, greenhouse is, is all due to humans as well. Um, and I will, I will just say that it, I'm not favoring one hypothesis over other, but there is, whenever you say that we're uh, killing off uh, a lot of species, uh, or a lot of species are dying off, uh, that's missing part of the equation, which is how many species are being created. That's rarely mentioned. It would be like saying that humans are dying off at 50 million a year, uh, and therefore, that, that, that. So, we need to talk about birth rate as well. And there, are, when we're creating a large number of new species, intentionally and, and non-intentionally. And then, and then uh, the trend in the population uh, demographics is about 1.2 children per year. And it doesn't take much math to realize that that's not an explosion, that's an implosion. And it's not due to uh, disasters, it's just due to uh, what, people, what people want to do when they uh, enter cities. And then finally, uh, for greenhouse, I will make the argument that most of the greenhouse effects were set up by our ancestors when they killed off all the herbivores in the tundra, and that that it can be reversed uh, in the future. So it's not so much what we're doing in the present. So I'll just give you quick examples that you all know. These are, uh, this is what ancient genetics can do. Uh, you know, watermelons were mostly rind there, and uh, bananas were mostly these big black seeds. Um, eggplants are these little berry-like things. That carrot doesn't look very delectable on the left, uh, or, or the corn on the left. Um, and so what we have uh, is this, uh, in terms of carbon, 
uh, oh, I, oh, I should mention that I've had the uh, Department of Energy funding since I started my lab in 1987, uh, which, for which I'm very grateful. It's uh, by far the, the, the longest and, and most uh, um, important grant that I've had um, my entire career. Anyway, so uh, we think about uh, carbon in many ways, and the, the tundra has 1,400 gigatons of carbon at risk. It is, uh, to put this in perspective, uh, the entire atmosphere is 850 gigatons, and the amount that we burn every year in fossil fuels worldwide for all sources, coal and gasoline and so forth, is only nine gigatons per year. Um, tropical forests are 375. So the 1,400 risk is, includes uh, methane, a huge fraction of that is methane, and, uh, and that has a factor of 30 to 80, depending on how you count it, times uh, the global warming impact of uh, carbon dioxide. So one of the things that we're exploring, many, one of many things that we're exploring that could uh, impact this is impacting the soil temperature because that, it is the soil temperature that puts that 1,400 gigatons at risk. And one of the ways of impacting soil temperature is uh, via cold-resistant elephants. Now, that may seem like a, a whimsical, and it is, uh, approach. But, we, but anyway, we've studied now uh, population genetics on 23 elephant genomes, um, about half of them extinct. Um, and we looked for 44 genes, or found 44 genes under positive selection, many of them uh, probably uh, adapting to cold. And so we've now done uh, editing of the genomes of these, and we'll get later to the, some of the technology behind synthesizing and editing, but we've, uh, to jump to an application, we've done all 44 of those genetic regions, and now we're working on um, making uh, embryos. And the idea here is that trees and snow insulate in the winter, and they, and they collect solar heat in the, in, in the summer. Um, in a way that's it's two times the albedo, or sorry, it, it, it's two times less reflective than the grass, and the grass is also better at photosynthesis. And uh, so this, I'm, I'm collaborating with a group in, in uh, Siberia, that uh, I'll be there um, in a couple of weeks, uh, called Pristine Park, um, and where they've returned many herbivores and they're studying the ecosystem, and the soil temperature can vary by as much as 20 degrees in the negative, uh, meaning colder, and in the presence of these herbivores, the herbivores can strip the trees, but they can't knock them over. These guys can knock them over in about 15 seconds. These are some of my collaborators um, who work on this project. Another, another topic of ecosystem e engineering on a grand scale, and, it, and, and many of these things have cautionary notes that go with them. Uh, my lab, uh, in developing technologies, we also try to alert the public to, uh, to big decisions that have to be made, um, not necessarily things uh, whether they should be avoided or not. And so we're interested in uh, ways that we can um, deal with uh, serious diseases like malaria and Lyme disease that are spread by vectors, not necessarily by killing the vector or making the vector extinct, but by uh, making the vector resistant to uh, the disease carrying um, um, <clears throat> moieties. And, and so th in this case, we have, uh, we have local gene drive, uh, the emphasis being that if you're not careful, they become global gene drives. And so I'm going to describe briefly how we can make them local gene drives. And the, I the idea of a gene drive is that unlike normal genetics, Mendelian genetics, where things spread, where uh, the mother and the father have a 50% chance of their mother's and father's genes being uh, donated to the next generation. Um, instead of 50%, it becomes 100%. Every, every offspring has the same thing for a particular position and a particular chromosome, which you can choose. And so, for example, so to be uh, more explicit, here's a pedigree of uh, uh, you know, a colorful gene drive in, in, in um, and we use fluorescent markers in, uh, this is a schematic, in mosquitoes, and the mosquito work is done by a graduate student, Andy Smidler, who's a joint graduate student with uh, the Cattaruccia lab at the Harvard School of Public Health. And, uh, and, and this 
actually works uh, uh, quite well. You want to, uh, in, the, in the laboratory, in fact, it works so well that, that we've taken on um, theoretical and experimental studies to try to keep it from going uh, uh, exponential through the population, at least uh, until we're ready. And, and so, so what we have here is one of the editing mechanisms that I'll mention a little bit more later on is, um, uh, is called CRISPR, and it's, and it's represented here as scissors, although there's really elegant crystal structures uh, that are much, much higher resolution than those scissors. But they, they cut the, the drive as a piece of DNA that encodes the CRISPR scissors and your payload. And the payload can have be multiple genes that, that confer resistance to the, to the disease organism. And, and what you do is you only spread, it's like a transposon that can, transposons typically hop around randomly, but this particular transposon will only hop to a particular place in a particular chromosome. And it does it with nearly 100%, say 98% efficiency. And, it, and, uh, and then when it doesn't hop, uh, that, those particular gametes or products of the gametes will die. But most of them will survive and they will, um, and they will repair to the correct, uh, to, to what you want. And so it spreads, uh, you can see in this plot, it spreads uh, very quickly through the whole population. Um, we've made a version of this where one gene drive is dependent on another gene drive for its function, and none of them are, are truly exponential gene drives. So it's a daisy chain where, where uh, C will um, cut B and B will cut A, and only if all those happen will A rise through the population. And so C is... Is so has nothing helping it out, so it it decays quickly due to the forces of uh, selection, uh, selecting against any 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 random foreign DNA that doesn't have any advantage to the organism. And then B goes a little bit better because it has C helping it out, and then A go, uh, goes much faster. Um, and you can you can adjust the parameters so that that A could go to fixation if you, if you want. Now, part of the reason that, that we're having these conversations, I, you know, those were introductory uh, examples of what one can do with the technology. Now I want to take a deeper dive into the technology. And I would say that there are two categories of, that are very obvious, uh, reading and writing genomes, just like you can read and write to disk drives or, or, or to books. Um, but this has been a real revolution where reading and writing of, of biological uh, materials was going a sort of at a Moore's Law rate um, since I started in the field um, in the 70s, which is a pretty fast exponential. I mean, these are factors of 10 on the y-axis, and, and, uh, and, and it was remarkable. But then it changed slope, uh, showing that these aren't really Moore's Law isn't a law. Uh, uh, it can be broken, and, uh, and it'd be broken in a very positive sense. So the slope changed so dramatically in 2003 and 4. Um, that we were going at about uh, tenfold per year, and it and it's it plateaus occasionally here and there, but I think it still has uh, several orders of magnitude left in it. And to put this in perspective, work from from my lab and many of my collaborators and colleagues, uh, we've reduced the cost of reading genomes about ten million fold. So that's went from a three billion dollar genome, which was actually not a very good genome in the sense it was not clinical grade. It was Instead of having representation of both your mother and your father's genome, it was a, a, a single genome, kind of a mishmash of those two. So um, it was a milestone, but nevertheless, we had to keep working to get the clinical grade, which happened a, a few years later with next generation sequencing. And that's partly what happened uh, to cause that uh, it not only got higher quality, but it got uh, much cheaper. And so now it's about. Um, it's about $600 to produce a genome, a human genome deployed cl clinical grade. Now, what happened was not um, directly a consequence of the genome project. Certainly was stimulating us all to think about uh, bringing the price down because we weren't going to be sequencing genomes for $3 billion each for very long. Um, it was not a result of automation, per se. Automation just allows you to spend more money faster. Uh, it basically is the same as a, as a person to a first approximation. Uh, it was not a, 
uh, parallelization, which again, you can buy a lot of machines and put them in the same room, but again, it just it doesn't change the price structure. Um, it was multiplexing, and multiplexing is something that uh, Edison started in the 1800s uh, for telegraph lines where you could send multiple messages along uh, a wire. In this case, it's not multiple messages, but multiple chemical reactions or biochemical reactions that happen in a single tube or in a single flow cell. You can do millions or billions of reactions with the same effort of doing one. It's like every time you pipette, you feel like you're only doing one thing, but you're actually doing a billion. So it greatly empowers you, um, and that we call molecular multiplexing. So that's, we think, is the, is the big cause of most of what's been happening to uh, reading and writing. Now I'm going to just show, this is an example of the latest in, in reading and writing, which is in C2 sequencing, and I'm going to have to show this a couple of times uh, because it, um, so what we're going to see here is a single cell. Each dot is a single messenger RNA molecule um, that, it, that is going through cycles of ACGT. The dots are staying put at first, not moving, but changing color going, as you go through the cycles of ACGT. And then the computer reformats uh, that, re displays that as a barcode. Each of those single RNA dots is now a barcode that you can look up in the computer and you can find out what RNAs are in each position of each cell. And you don't necessarily even do a single cell at a time. You can do um, whole tissue sections, um, serial sections, do re 3D reconstruction of, of, of brains and so forth. Now that was RNA. We can also, uh, DNA is even more, I think will be even more evident to you as stru structural biologists, um, what you can do in, and this is uh, work from Ting Lu's lab and Peng Yun's are professors at, at Harvard with whom I collaborate closely. Here you can step through the chromosomes, so just like you can make the three-dimensional structure of a, of a macromolecular complex by, um, uh, you know, X-ray or, or EM uh, imaging, this is fluorescent in situ imaging. And here, looking at three chromosomes, chromosome 19 and 5 and 3, starting with chromosome 19, and you're walking through um, the computer version of this um, uh, in little chunks at a time, just to, so you can see this is building up. Uh, you're going along the chromosome 19, and now you're starting to pick up 5 and 3. And it, just as you go through the cycles of the RNA analysis, where we're picking up uh, different base pairs in RNA. Here you're picking up different regions of the chromosome, but it, in, intellectually they're very similar concepts of you can sequence by hybridization or sequence by synthesis. Here you're doing three chromosomes simultaneously and they just get longer and longer um, until you have uh, a good idea how they fold. And you will note there's two of each chromosome here. This is a, a, a diploid human nucleus. These are actually uh, cells from my body. Um, you'll see more of them soon. Um, and, and you can do this in principle for the whole, this hasn't been done yet, but for, in principle for the whole chromosome, uh, sorry, the whole genome, simultaneously uh, you can get the, the location of every um, base pair from telomere to t from tip to tip. Um, and we might actually finish a human genome. A little, little dirty secret is we've never actually finished the sequence of any human uh, completely. Uh, and so this may allow us by not fragmenting the genomes, by looking at them in situ, you might be able to trace the chain all the way. So I showed RNA and DNA, we, the same sort of methodology, this in situ methodology, and I should mention that that last set was done with a super resolution storm microscopy, um, which has a resolution on the order of, uh, sorry, precision on the order of 15 nanometers. So 15 nanometers is getting sort of in the range of a couple of nucleosomes, a couple of uh, basic units of, of the DNA folding. So that's RNA, DNA, and now protein. You can use protein with the same sort of methodology. This is a slightly different way of getting super resolution. Again, sitting in, this, in the uh, tens of nanometer resolution. And this is done by um, uh, labeling each protein with an antibody, labeling each antibody with a DNA. The DNA is what we're directly detecting by hybridization, just as we did in the previous experiments with DNA and RNA. So we've essentially reduced the protein problem to 
a nucleic acid problem that's already solved. Uh, so it's kind of sort of the way you would do a mathematical proof is you reduce it to something you know how to do. And so you can see uh, in the upper um, uh, left here are these little Y-shaped uh, antibody molecules, each with a little tail hanging off it, which is a, a oligonucleotide barcode that you've designed to be uh, orthogonal, so they're easy to, to, sep to, to keep separate. And you could do, we don't, we could probably do as many antibodies as we want, just like with the DNA RNA, there's no obvious upper limit to how many, how much complexity we can handle in these experiments. Um, and you can do them simultaneously, and there's, I think there's certain advantages of doing these things simultaneously, in that you get uh, better integration at, uh, of the results. So, 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 and what happens is once you have these oligonucleotides, you can bind to them these fluorescent probes, and the probes pop on and off rapidly, and that popping on and off rapidly allows you to uh, collect many different uh, uh, data on the XYZ coordinates of the fl fluorescent emission, and that allows you to get, to go from a very blurry uh, conventional diffraction limited uh, image to something where you're instead measuring the centroid of each blinking dot, um, and this is called DNA paint, where the, where the fluorescent flops on and off uh, oscillates uh, due to the, uh, the weak binding of these two DNA molecules. And now you're measuring centroids, and so you now get a super resolution where you've improved from sort of the sort of 50, uh, 200 to 500 nanometer resolution to this uh, 15 to 50 nanometer resolution. And this allows us to do something very important in this case, where we wanted to uh, measure the connectivity of the brain, uh, each, each of your 86 billion neurons in your brain has about a thousand synaptic connections to other neurons. Each of those synapses, it matters um, which neuron is connected to which neuron, that's called the connectome, but also matters what direction it's going and whether it's in, in, inhibitory or excitatory. And so with, with just four of the, of the 10 proteins or so that we can, we, we, uh, just four of them are sufficient to, to get these vectors, these, these white lines that tell you going from presynaptic to postsynaptic. And so here's, uh, you know, uh, synapse in one and uh, in red and bassoon in, in, in green is postsynaptic. And then um, v, VGAT uh, is another, uh, an another one. And each of these uh, agree, and you can only get the pre and postsynaptic whether they're excitatory or inhibitory. And this is work from <coughs> Yu Wang, who is a graduate student who is shared between my lab and Peng Yin's. Now, I mentioned that, that a lot of these experiments are done with, uh, with cells from my body. Fortunately, we don't have to harvest them every day, but uh, uh, I am guinea pig number one because it's, it's more ethical for my lab to, to do experiments on me than for me to do it on them. Uh, <laughs> And so we like, we like to be ethical, and, uh, and our IRB likes this as well. And, but we have a big project it's now, international. It, it was uh, unorthodox when we started it in 2005, but it's now uh, conventional enough that it's, that it's operating in U.S. and Canada and uh, uh, London and Vienna and um, three Asian groups are, are starting uh, this year. And it's, uh, it's been used for the NIST and the FDA, two important uh, uh, American agencies, uh, for a unique collaboration on standardization of, of genomes where they've made tens of thousands of vials that are identical um, samples of DNA. So you can, if you're developing new methods, uh, new diagnostics and uh, so forth, you can share exactly the same DNA batch. Um, and they're also, we also uh, have cells um, uh, primary cells and stem cells are available, um, and all kinds of data on, on these are on real individuals. These are not um, they are not de-identified; they're identifiable um, people. And you know, and we have everything from from molecular level to whole organism level. These are these are brain scans, fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging. This, these are on my brain um, in 2009. We have a a new data set that's just coming online uh, today, uh, or sort of this, uh, this month or so in uh, 
from Toronto. This was done in, in Boston. These are, uh, as you may have guessed, these are virtual slices, not actual slices of my brain. So, um, okay. So, uh, and also it's been used in the ENCODE project where we're, where uh, uh, international team is annotating every base pair of the genome to say what does it do, what does it bind, what proteins does it bind to, what RNAs does it make, and so forth. And and prior to this personal genome project, there was not a there was no real good um, set of cells where they had the same genome, but they had different cell types, different uh, epigenomes. They had so so now there's uh, eleven isogenic cell types. Same genome, different you know nerves and and uh, B cells and and so on. Okay. So now uh, getting back to the the thing that I mentioned at the beginning, which is changing the genetic code. This is a I think this is one of the cutting edge uh, experiments in synthetic biology because we literally have to change um, uh, every gene. Uh, in order to change the the, the, the code the codons, the, there's 64 triplet codons that, that that allow you to go from the DNA RNA code to protein code, and so um, we've now completely completed completely successfully changed one codon of the 64, making an organism first organism in the world who uh, only uses 63 codons. Now there there are a few different variations on the genetic code in nature. But they all use all 64 of the triplet codons. Uh, this is the first one. Any uh, natural, unnatural, it didn't. And it ha and we did this not just because we could, but because there were three practical um, advantages. One is non-standard amino acids, which is now being used uh, uh, commercially by uh, uh, GrowBio that Dan Mandel started to make a uh, replacement for disulfide bonds. So this can make you can make disulfide bonds under or Disulfide equivalents with diselenized uh, selenium uh, atoms, um, which uh, is useful um, because you can make it in reducing it in environments, and they can also use for anomalous scattering. You also have uh, uh, genetic and metabolic isolation, which can be used for biocontainment. And I think the most significant reason is in this red box is that we think we can now make any organism resistant to all viruses. Um, uh, with a very simple strategy, which is changing the genetic code of one transfer RNA, or one, in this case, release factor in the first one, and we're changing uh, seven codons. Now we're almost done the synthesis of, of this particular one. That involves 62,000 changes in the genome. As we finish that up, we've, we've are overlapping a project where we're making larger uh, genomes. That was E. coli, which is one of the major industrial microorganisms for which viral contamination is a, a big industrial problem. But there's also uh, viral contamination or viral problems in uh, various uh, dairy uh, microorganisms, in agricultural animals and plants, and in uh, human ce cells using cell, cell therapy, and, and mammalian cells used for, for making uh, protein, pharmaceuticals, antibodies, vaccines. In fact, one of the big factories in the United States and Europe, uh, Genzyme, was shut down for two years because of a viral infection. Anyway, so we're, do we're making uh, human cells that resist all viruses. This is the human genetic code. Each of these numbers is the number of times that it's used um, in, uh, in the human proteome, each of these codons, these, these triplets. And so up here is, is phenylalanine, the first codon that was decoded um, in the 60s, and then below that is leucine and so forth. And there, there are three uh, amino acids for, which have six codons each. Some have as little as one codon, um, like meth uh, methionine down here. Anyway, this is the kind of the roadmap for what we, what we can change. The, the smallest change that we could do is, is changing um, on the order of 4,000, 5,000 uh, codons to change one stop codon. Very analogous to the first thing we did for E. coli. Now, uh, so a slightly less genomic scale, but still, you know, but get, getting there is is the way of doing transplants. And for the first time in the in decades of human transplantation, 
we can now transplant without, uh, between two individuals who are not matched for histocompatibility. They're not perfectly matched. Um, and, and this is sometimes called a universal uh, donor procedure or um, um, allogeneic. And, and, uh, and it's one of the main uses so far is this, this chimeric antigen receptor uh, T cell therapy, which is, or CAR, CAR T, which is used um, for attacking cancer cells. So you engineer T cells from one person to attack cancer cells from the, from the recipient, um, initially uh, uh, B lymphomas and leukemias, and this is one of the first children that was cured by this uh, method, and it's been using all the, a variety of editing enzymes. I'm not gonna go through all the editing mechanisms, but these are zinc fingers, talons, and CRISPR. Um, and uh, in, in my lab has had played a, a, at least a, a, a small or large role in, in each of these uh, different technologies, and, and we're working on some others that'll hopefully replace them. But basically, these are used for either removing uh, functionality. The, the CAR-T itself is kind of classical transgenic technology, so it's not editing, it's just adding, it's adding genes. You can also subtract genes here, knocking out uh, beta-2 microglobulin, which is a part of the major histocompatibility, and adding in a new histocompatibility, which is much more tolerant of transplant from person to person. Taking this one step further, we, we, we have uh, adapted pigs, um, which are even further away from, than to humans, um, but it's the same kind of idea, is that you can replace the pig histocompatibility with the human H HLAE, um, but there's other things that have to be done. The carbohydrates are incompatible, which is not true between two humans. Um, there's uh, clotting and complement components of the blood that are incompatible. And the biggest one, the thing that really set it back, um, there was about a $2 billion investment 20 years ago um, that, 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 freak, that the FDA and, uh, and the industry got freaked out by the fact that there were endogenous retroviruses and, and so uh, that are released from every organ of every pig in the world. And you could just imagine that in an immune-suppressed patient that this would be uh, a disaster of where you could evolve a new zoonotic disease, um, just like HIV and swine flu and Ebola are all zoonotic diseases that evolve crossover from animals to humans. So you would not want to do that as part of a therapy. So we said as our first thing we wanted to edit is to edit uh, all of the endogenous retroviruses, uh, or PERS, that's not my acronym, but um, there are 62 of them in the genome and we, uh, and that seemed quite daunting because the biggest, the largest number of genes we had knocked out at the time, even with the awesome power of CRISPR, was just two. And so this was a big step up. But we decided we would, we should try anyway because there's no point in it otherwise. And it was embarrassingly easy in 14 days sitting in the incubator basically and a few PCRs and we had the knocked out all 62. And then we did it again uh, in a fresh set of cells that were, uh, more suited for uh, cloning, and we then cloned uh, a number of, uh, quite a few at this point, uh, pigs that are <clears throat> now have no endogenous retroviruses, and they didn't even reacquire them during the process of cloning. Um, so uh, they're now adults, and they're breeding normally, and they are the basis of, <clears throat> of uh, uh, further steps where we're making them uh, hu as humanized adequately so they can be uh, donors. We've begun uh, non-human primate uh, clinical trials to, uh, to establish their safety and efficacy in non-human primates. Now one of the things exciting about uh, organ engineering is not just that we have a crisis involving millions of human beings that can benefit, but it's also the possibility of, of doing enhancement. Enhancement is not something that's easy to get FDA approval for uh, in, a, in a healthy human being because there's a huge risk that you will hurt them rather than help them. Um, and sometimes the payoff might be much later, for example, with aging uh, components. But if you're transferring an organ, you want that organ to be the best it can be. You don't want it to succumb to the same disease the first organ did 
You don't want it to senesce too rapidly. Uh, if, if your first liver uh, just <coughs> had problems with hepatitis, you don't want the incoming fresh liver to get it. So you'd like your, your, like your organs to be resistant to pathogens, to cancer, to senescence. To, uh, you, I've already mentioned the immunity, but, and you'd also like to be able to cryopreserve them, potentially. I've already described ways that we can make uh, any organism resistant to all viruses. That's one category of pathogens. It also turns out that, that pigs uh, don't, many of, the, many of the pathogens we worry most about in humans are, do not infect pig cells naturally. So if we get rid of the, 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 the viruses that are endogenous to pigs, then they become, so for example, they don't get hepatitis or uh, HIV. And then the, the, here are three animals that inspire us be, uh, for the cryopreservation because these animals can be frozen solid <clears throat> and, and thawed and live uh, a happy life. Now in terms of senescence and cancer, these have been demonstrated in, um, in, uh, in mice uh, or, or, and, and or have a huge genetic component. We've studied uh, extreme values uh, by, by sequencing genomes of animals that live a long time, um, including the bowhead whale and the naked mole rat, uh, which are uh, outliers on this plot of, of uh, adult mass versus uh, maximum age. We've also st studied the uh, uh, largest number, we've sequenced uh, the largest number of supercentenarians, people like Jean Clement there who are celebrating her 121st birthday um, people who live past <coughs> 100, 110 are called supercentenarians. And you can look through all of the data from those sources and a variety of other sources, most of them, most, most powerfully, uh, classic developmental cell biology, and you can list about 10 different um, pathways. And these are, many of them are understood fairly well, uh, well enough that you can start designing um, gene therapies that can work in older animals, and, and what we're aiming for is not longevity, but aging reversal. And I'm not gonna say much about this, but the point, the, the advantage of aging reversal is if you go to the FDA and say, uh, I wanna extend the life of a healthy person by 30 years, they're gonna require a 30 year clinical trial. It's prohibitive, um, but aging reversal is something you can observe in a period of months, and we, and we have uh, it, things that in, work transgenically in mice also work in, um, uh, in a gene therapy uh, uh, format. And the major uh, uh, vector that we use for gene therapy is called uh, adeno-associated virus, or AAV, and I'm just gonna end uh, by telling a little story about how we're engineering AAV to be better in terms of uh, immunogenicity, have better uh, delivery um, on target, better tissue specificity or tissue generality, depending on whether you want to deliver it everywhere or just to a small number. And, uh, and I'm not going to tell you all the different uh, things that we've produced in terms of, I'm not even going to mention the last, <clears throat> uh, the data on the last bullet where we can reduce uh, innate immunity, but I'm going to sh show you what we can do with the, the, the structural biology um, by uh, engineering the combination of uh, design, uh, looking at the three-dimensional structure, uh, and the kind of multiplex synthesis we've been talking about so far. So we want to use selection, but selection not on randomly mutagenized as, as this kind of classic uh, way, but but by, by specific synthesis. So we've, sy we've synthesized now over 200,000 different uh, viral genomes uh, and tested them in uh, many different tissues. So essentially, in a very simple experiment, we can in inject hundreds of thousands of different viruses that have each been designed in a pool. They've been synthesized in a pool. So we've never actually individually manipulated this. Again, this is a marvel of molecular multiplexing. Inject it into an animal, and then harvest the various organs, and you can see which viruses went to which organ, and you can figure out what happened, and you cycle back, and you, um, you just, just using uh, multiplexing synthesis at the beginning of the process and multiplex sequencing at the end, and that allows you to then pipe that into machine learning algorithms where we can ask which amino acids were, were most influential 
in delivering to a particular tissue or avoiding a particular uh, antibody. And we do this by a combination of wide search where we have systematically changed every possible nucleotide um, in the genome or in a particular region of the genome. And we combine that with a deep search where our goal is to go as, as far as possible from a particular genomic uh, position. Think of a sequencing space, se uh, sequence, amino acid sequence space, or nucleotide codon space. So, so I'm just going to quickly show you each of these. The wide search where we're making one mutation at a time, very orderly, we, we know exactly what each one does. Here's a heat map uh, that shows places that are highly tolerant. Uh, of uh, either substitutions or ins insertions um, versus the, the, the uh, regions that are uh, very intolerant. And we can, we can find uh, positions where uh, we have odd codon choices, again talking about this triplet codon, the 64 codons, where it just doesn't quite make sense from, they should be equivalent amino acids. And what we've done in this process, we've found overlapping um, functional elements uh, that were, even though this is one of the most studied viruses on the planet, because it's, it's, it's the, it's the uh, main one that's used for gene therapy, uh, and it's a very small virus, um, we've discovered uh, uh, in the process of systematically looking at every, every base pair, every possible base pair that every base pair can turn into, uh, we, we found a, a new gene, uh, a, a gene that uh, uh, that overlap uh, other genes. And this is kind of the, that, that same heat map now displayed on the inside of the vir virus capsid on the left and on the uh, outside on the, on the right. Uh, the red ones being the ones that are uh, more tolerant of the uh, change and it makes sense that those would be at the tip, at the, at the very tips of, of the outer um, uh, amino acid, the furthest on the outside. Uh, this is where we've uh, compared it to a different kind of, uh, of uh, structural component from cryo-EM, where you can uh, find where the antibodies are binding with a particular monoclonal antibody called A20, and we can, um, we can not only show um, lower uh, immune reaction to the immune system in general, but to a particular epitope of particular antibodies, which is what was done in this experiment. Um, and this, this is where we're looking at tissue specificity, and you can see we get a very different heat map, a uh, different uh, set of amino acids that correspond. Uh, um, so I forgot to mention that the x-axis here is position in the genome, and the y-axis is all the different substitutions. So in the little letters on the y-axis are all the different kind of amino acids. But you can see a different heat map um, for uh, blood, heart, liver, kidney, spleen, and lung. And this is the work from um, on the deep, deep search. And the goal here is we've got, these are naturally occurring serotypes. These are different AAV isolates from, the, from, from humans and living in the wild. And what's interesting is they're quite far apart. Uh, there, there are these big gaps between these oases uh, where there's 100 to 300 mutations. And we'd like to know, well, what if we filled those in? Or what happens if we go that same distance out in orthogonal in other directions? And so what we're looking for is when you, when you typically when you mutagenize, uh, say, AAV2, you can, you can only get one to four mutations away before you start breaking it. Um, but we know that you can bridge these much bigger gaps because they have nearly identical crystal structures, but they vary by as much as 300. So what we want to do instead is take uh, this, um, take one of those points and really go as far away from it as possible, um, going up to say 42 mutations. So uh, not quite 100 to 300, but we're getting there. And so we do that um, with these libraries I've been describing, um, where the machine learning takes uh, takes guesses as to what's compatible using all the information and all the the known serotypes, plus all our previous mutagenesis experiments. And, uh, and this is what happens. Uh, if you do a random library, you get very shallow, um, very hard to get far from wild type. But in this deep search, we can uh, uh, quickly 
uh, get to um, a very far away. So each of those rounds takes you further and further away from, from the, the original wild time. And again, we can use that, that kind of, uh, I showed you previously a heat map for different tissues based on one mutation at a time. This is what happens when you do the really deep search. Okay. So I've already showed you this slide, that's the, but this shows the, the, the loop that we go through where we do DNA synthesis selection, DNA sequencing, machine learning. We loop back and do more synthesis. And I've, I've just done, we've done now done over 200,000 of these uh, viruses, and it's, and it's very easy to, to keep going. So these are the, the people that are involved in this particular set of experiments. Uh, Pierce Ogden is a graduate student, Eric Kelsick um, is a is a postdoctoral fellow, and Sam Sinai is, is one of the research fellows. So I'm going to uh, open it up for questions there. This is, we've been talk, opened it up with uh, engineering ecosystems, um, gave two examples of how we can make resistance to all viruses so far in the in a industrial microorganism E. coli, uh, but soon in uh, plants and animals, hopefully. And then uh, some experiments we have done on, on pigs that are going into clinical trials. And then finally, this AAV, which is the work, one of the major workhorse for gene therapy, which we're taking uh, very seriously. So thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? Questions? First of all, I'll ask you a question. Uh, how many people here have their full genome sequence? <laughs> Two of us. That's pretty typical, actually. I, I don't know why I keep asking. Well, I, I, someday I'll ask that question and it'll be different. It's only 600 bucks now. Back there. Oh, on these learning algorithms that you described in your last section, are they predicting just one single base pair mutation at a time, or are these larger changes that you're trying to predict? We use the single base change data along with all the evolutionary data, which are up to 300 changes, um, to, to say what is tolerated. And then, and then the computer um, uses that plus structural analysis. So we're not act for, there are other experiments where we use um, uh, molecular mechanics calculations, but this one is purely based on what's been tolerated in previous experiments. But, but the, the machine learning is very rich, so you can use it in a variety of different ways. I'm just, this is one example. There's a question back there, I think. Yeah. I have a question about uh, ecosystems and um, uh, the elephants specifically. Uh, you, you said uh, you were at the stage of, you identified 40-something loci uh, and, and modified them in, 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 in the genomes of an actual elephant, right? To, and then is that cloning and uh, developing a new, well, a, a cloned elephant? And, but what is the end game? You will these modified elephants, will they be uh, uh, put in the, in the wild in this area of uh, Siberia? That, and what do you hope to achieve with that? Right. So um, the question was about the end game for uh, the work on the elephants. So, so it's very analogous to what we've done with pigs. And the, the pigs are much further along. We, we've now made fully uh, healthy uh, pigs that are quite radically altered in their in multiple places in their genome. Uh, for the elephants, the goal is to, uh, the Asian elephants is an endangered species, and it's mostly because they're uh, in tight uh, competition with humans uh, in warmer climates, in highly populated climates. But in Siberia, they are, or in Canada and Alaska for that matter as well, uh, this very low population density. Um, and there's, a, I, I think, an ecosystem need for them to re restore the environment to something that had a 
more healthy balance between trees and grass, um, and that will help lower the the uh, soil temperature. The experiments done in Pleistocene Park seem to indicate that, that that the theoretical expectation is is dramatically correct that the soil temperature can be lowered by 20 degrees centigrade. Um, so that would, the end game then would be to make as many of these as possible, probably on the order of 80,000 or so. Um, and it may seem like that's uh, expensive or something, but 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 uh, a, a precedent for that is the, the bison. Bison were down in the low hundreds worldwide of animals uh, nearly extinct, and now there's 500,000 of them worldwide by creating, uh, by recognizing potential uh, economic benefits. So it didn't even require government funding to get back up to half a million bison. So that we're going to try to do something like that. You're on. Hello. Um, I'm an intern from MSIPP. And I had a question about one of the slides that you had. Yeah. Um, it had go back to it. the CRISPR, and then it had C translating to B, which went to A. Um, CRISPR. Oh, Daisy. Yeah. That one? Yeah, yeah. OK. There you go. Okay. Yeah, and with that, how does it work? Is it like with each embryo, do you have to like inject or gene edit with C in order yeah. for A to be successful, or is it just with the parent and then it just goes on? So in each of the, the easiest one to understand is, the, is the, the upper one. In each of these cases, in principle, you can introduce a single animal into a, a vast population of trillions of mosquitoes and it will get a slow start, but, but, but an exponential one, so that each mosquito might have 200 uh, per brood and several of broods per season. Um, each of those, all 200 of them uh, inherit the gene and they spread through the population. Um, with the, the lower one, it's a little more complicated. I mean, in practice, you wouldn't put in a single organism. You would put um, millions. I mean, you could... There are facilities that make sterile male for uh, similar kinds of uh, effort uh, uh, in the billions uh, of mosquitoes. Um, anyway, you would millions of billions would be released, and in, and in the lower one, there would be of each type. You'd have millions of billions of each uh, a, a, cDNA, and then every time um, C would would would. Uh, 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 Breed with a mosquito that had B, it would it would convert B to being double B. And every time B interacts with A, it will convert A to both two A's, and then and so forth. So they spread through the population in a controlled manner. The whole point is to try to disable something that is in a way too powerful, um, and it allows you to keep uh, the population local um, in space and time. So if it's on an island, it will spread to the edge of the island, but it can't spread to the mainland because the, there's not enough of, of, of the sea uh, to, to spread. Yes, we are at this CRISPR cutting. Yesterday, I came across a report from the Sanger Institute uh, published in the 16th, they reported much larger damage in DNA and even far away from the clipping site. Uh, are there similar studies on the other gene editing method, Talon, and the other one you had there? Right. Just to restate that question, um, Alan Bradley's group just published in Nature Biotechnology a paper, which I've been asked to comment on a number of times, about that we're where CRISPR cuts, and for that matter, any double-strand break, uh, this has been known for over a decade, uh, the zinc finger nucleases and talons have the same property. If you make a double-strand break, um, the cell will uh, make a mess. And, and in fact, I've been trying to convince my colleagues not to call it 
editing, because editing implies a very precise process. Um, I, I call it genome vandalism. But anyway, the, this, this paper kind of uh, made, made a point that we've been making for years. Um, and there are alternatives. So for example, if you cut, so what's, what's happening is you cut, make a double strand break, the cell ma makes it perfect fusion most of the time. But then, but then, it, it rec then the CRISPR recognizes it, cuts it again, and it fuses, the cell fixes it. Cuts again, so it keeps doing that until finally the cell just says, ah, forget about it, and just make the mess, okay? And that mess can be of any size, and that's, that's the point of this paper. Uh, but the alternative is if you do two cuts near one another, then what happens is the cell uh, with high frequency will, will merge those two, and now it will no longer cut because you, you've removed the, the sequence that's been recognizing that was in the piece of DNA that disappeared, and so, so instead of having this cycle of cutting, fixing, cutting, and then ho hoping something happens, you get a nice clean uh, fusion. So that's one thing you can do using CRISPR. On the other hand, you're not limited to CRISPR, and there's a lot of recombinases, uh, integrases, and uh, uh, single-stranded DNA-mediated homologous recombination and, and lambda red system. There's there's several systems that we and others are working on, which actually is precise editing. It's what we should reserve the term editing for. Um, so I, I've been quite, no, normally when I give these talks, I, I have a whole bunch of slides about how messed up CRISPR is. Uh, I should be much nicer to it uh, since it's been very nice to me. Uh, but anyway, I just like to tell it like it is. So it's, you know, this is, it's a nice paper, but it's not a surprising paper. Move across the room, actually. I think we had a couple of questions over here, please. Uh, so, so there's two things you can do. If you, if you just delete the, the whatever was working at that codon, was a, a, a release factor or a transfer RNA, if you delete that, it already has new properties, which is it's virus resistant right away. If you, you can also put in a, a new transfer RNA or re-engineer re the old transfer RNA so that it has a new amino acid. Not all amino acids, it's not, it's not as, that's not that, uh, there's a, maybe a hundred non-standard amino acids that have currently been adapted. Some of them are more efficient than others, some of them, some, but that's really a matter of how much effort has gone into the evolution of the tRNA synthetase enzyme that puts the amino acid on. But we've used it, we've used it uh, very effectively for making uh, a cell that's biocontained, meaning it's, it's so dependent upon this non-standard amino acid that it can't escape. It, it, and that amino acid is a, or only made by organic synthesis, not by biochemistry. And we've also, I, I mentioned the diselenides, so you can have a, a selenocysteine instead of a, 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 a sulfur-containing cysteine. And so the sulfur-containing cysteines are, are melted, essentially, they're, they're, the covalent bond is broken in the reducing atmosphere of the reducing environment of the normal cytoplasm. But the diselenide bond is stable to the reducing, so you can make the equivalent of a disulfide bond in the cytoplasm of, of any organism using that non-standard amino acid, which is selenocysteine. That's, those are some examples. But you also have fluorogenic amino acids, uh, uh, fluorescent amino acids, uh, amino acids that look like DNA base pairs, HCG and T and so forth. There's many things that you can do once you've freed up the codons, and that's why we're motivated to free up multiple codons now. Take a question here, and then we'll move back to Chick for the last question, so please. Um, so first of all, I really enjoyed the talk, and uh, I wanted to go back to one of the first slides. Uh, you showed you don't have to pull it up, but you can if you want, um, where you just showed the three um, sort of points that people often bring up in your, yeah, 
Yes, um, so about the first point, uh, I think that's a pretty good point. I never think about it that way, and I never hear it talked about uh, in that sense. But so do you have any estimates on how quickly new species are, are, are rising? And are you implying that, um, you know, if you consider the rest of the talk, that with some of the technologies you talked about, uh, you know, we could engineer new species and it would alter this, this rate of extinction versus genesis? Right, well, so there is a book that, recent, that came out uh, a few months ago. I, sorry, I can't remember the author, but I think it's called Six Genesis. Uh, where he makes the point that this is happening naturally. Uh, one of the major sources of new species historically, going way back, is hybridization, where uh, you, you, you have uh, um, grossly new properties when two previously isolated populations come together. And they may even be called separate species, but, and even though you think the species definition is you, you can't read them, in fact, most, many, many species of plants and animals and, and, and bacteria will breed and will even produce fertile offspring. There's an entire book on mammalian hybrids, for example, that are... Um, so, that's one sort, all those hybrids are new, are new species and they will start to, di to differentiate and, and, uh, and ramify. But in addition, there's a bunch of species that we are doing intentionally by engineering now, some of those you may say, well, those don't really, they wouldn't survive in the wild, but that doesn't, that doesn't matter. We're, it's not a wild planet anymore. Uh, they sort of, uh, in the same sense that, that there's codependency of species historically. Like, you know, wolves wouldn't survive in the wild if there weren't uh, prey for them to prey on. So they, they're not autotrophic. They don't just get sunlight and turn into wolves. So anyway. I, you know, it's, it's an interesting read. Uh, uh, I, I just like the, the uh, balance. balance if you, you can't just talk about extinction if you don't talk about new, new species. It's a little harder to study, but you can't have an argument. You can't create a logical argument without it. Uh, hi. Um, in your talk, you talked uh, about gene drive particularly with respect to fast-growing populations or generations that have short lifespans, insect vectors, things like that. How do you see the implications of gene drive for like human populations, yeah. just because of the longer time scales involved and, and, right. and how these effects could be manifested? Yeah, I think, I mean, just generalizing the question a little bit more is, you know, how do gene drives play out in organisms with slow generation times? And, or, or how do they play out in situations where we don't want the gene drive? Uh, and I think that if it's slow enough, and in fact, even the fastest gene drives are slow enough that, that if we're paying attention, we can detect them and reverse them. And that, that was one of our first priorities when we realized that there could be gene drives. We realized that somebody else was going to invent it pretty soon. And so our first paper should be one about containment, reversal, uh, and so forth. You, you don't really want to be introducing a new technology without a reversal. So that's been our um, emphasis. Um, but in humans, uh, we're so slow, and we're and we're and hopefully we're all going to get sequenced. Uh, it'd be hard to slip a gene drive into our. Uh, I mean, there've been some fanciful scenarios where you know. Rich folks would put gene drives so that you couldn't mate with poor folks or something like that. But I, I think it's good to bring up these worst case scenarios and, and get the ethics conversation going. But I think, practically speaking, that would be very challenging, at least the way that society seems to be going right, right now, uh, to do it in any slow reproducing uh, organism. Well, thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you. Dr. Church. Uh, one more round of applause, please, for Dr. Church. Thank you.